This post is about reef. When most people think about reef, they think about coral reefs. We do have those in British waters, but they tend to be in very deep water, and not accessible to divers. Or perhaps they think about rocky reefs, such as the ones on the uh, Sillies video that you can see elsewhere on this channel. This is a biogenic reef. This is a reef formed by a worm called Sabellaria spinulosa, which makes these tubes. So it's not very big, but it can uh, give rise to a lot of life. A lot of things live on it. So we just look at this uh, section of video here. This was uh, shot off the Dorset coast in 18 metres of water. There's a diver for scale. And you see these little patches of worm tubes. And the worm tubes are made of little grains of sand, which the worm cements together with its own mucilage. And they form these discontinuous reefs. And here we have a, a shot of a close-up and we can see the identical crowns, the sort of purplish colour, and the tubes themselves, which are made of these sand grains with larger grains over the outside. And they form these masses, which are fairly small, but over time they can build up, and they can last as a reef for quite a long time. We do a bit of wafting, so on this particular site, we should be able to see in a moment what's actually underneath this sand. And you can see the stand, sand extends between the individual areas of reef. And here we are, you can see it's on sediment. They're basically pebbles here, cobbles, which are different sized classes of clasts or pieces of rock. So this is a sand veneer over the top of basically a stony reef with gravel. And the sand moves, and the sand moves very, very frequently, you can tell by the ripples. And the worms get access to the sand when it gets up into the water column, and they make their uh, reefs out of it. But you can see here all the little holes and nooks and crannies in amongst the individual pieces of reef. And here we can see worm poo. And this is another way which worms, or aggregations of um, creatures such as this, can change the habitat around them. There's a lot of material here. And here we have another section of video. And you can see what the reef look, looks like. So individually it's fairly small. But there's an awful lot of things living there. And I think from that bit of wafting, you can extrapolate as to what this site would be like without this reef. It would basically be sand and gravel, with not very much here, maybe some coralline crusts on some of the clasts underneath the sand, and very little else. So I'm going to speculate here and ask a question. What would happen if somebody came through here with some bottom toad gear, um, looking for fish, or even scallops? There are a few scallops around, but not many. Would this reef uh, be ground down to nothing? And if so, what would be here in the aftermath of bottom toad gear processing this site? So we'll just drift over here and have a quick look at a few more things. There's Pentapora, Ross Coral, we've got red algae. We see a few little fish around. There's probably bigger fish, but we won't see those because the camera's constantly looking down. Whole different lot of hydroids and bryozoans and sponges. So very diverse, and much more diversity than there would be without these little creatures, these little worms, making this uh, this reef. So we'll let this run a little bit longer. Have a bit more of a look and see what's here. Got hydroids. See anemone in the background, the white one, is that Nathoe spiroidita? Got red algae. It's likely that there are hidey holes for fish and shrimps and other uh, potentially um, valuable species in amongst these reef units. But you can also see that some of these reef units are long and thin, even though we know that the sediment underneath, or the clasts, the pieces of rock, fairly small and discreet. 
So we've got bioconsolidation going on here. Sabalaria reef is tying sediment together and stabilising it. So if bottom toe gear was to come through here, it's likely that that bioconsolidation would be reversed. There's also the question of what will happen if it is left to run into the future. Will something else start to uh, develop here? Or will it just be a boom and bust cycle naturally? With the reef um, growing and then reducing as it gets high and above the level which the uh, Sabalaria worms can access the building blocks, the bits of sand for their tubes? We don't know. The only way we'll find out is to actually spend time and effort studying a section of reef such as this without it being um, destroyed periodically by uh, man-made causes. It's definitely a question that needs to be asked about um, seabeds and colonisation of sea heads, seabeds and succession as to how it works and how far it will go. Where will it end up? I have to make a confession to you at this stage. There was another site in this area which showed a reef very much like this and it got dredged by a boat that came in from Littlehampton and worked out a pool and the Sabalaria reef was completely smashed to pieces. When I last dived did, a couple of years after that event, the Sabalaria reef was starting to rebuild itself but it didn't look anything like this. I used to work as a countryside manager. When we came to decisions on how to manage a site, whether it was for food production or nature conservation or a compromise between both, we based those decisions on data. If you don't have valid data for a site, how do you make valid decisions on how to manage it properly for now and for the future? Unfortunately, since I became a marine ecologist, I've come across many sites such as this site but we don't have basic data on how a site behaves in the long term. Many, many sites have been damaged in the past by man-made extractive activities such as aggregate dredging, or in the case of the site near here, dredging for fisheries. So I believe that we need sites like this to be protected so that can be studied in the future and data acquired upon which to base management decisions in the future.